welcome to the Drake Group's webinar series on critical issues in collegiate athletics. Today's discussion, lack of accountability for athlete abuse in college athletics. Our moderator is Tammy Gaw, founder of Advantage Rule, a consulting group focused on athlete health and safety. Um, the Joy Group is an academic think tank working to better educate Congress, higher education leaders, and athletics administrators about critical issues in intercollegiate athletics. And as we talk today about abuse in college athletics and the mechanisms which will be put in place to hold colleges and universities, as well as coaches and athletic staff members accountable for such project or for such conduct, it's important to just know the history and you know understand that this can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. Um, over the last few decades, reported stories of athlete abuse in college athletics have become more frequent and uh, in many cases more egregious. Uh, incidents of abuse, including physical, mental, and sexual, have been swept under the carpet. Um, perpetrators are often allowed to move or resign, find other employment at other institutions. Um, there's definitely uh, the argument that the media as a whole is complicit, choosing to preserve their access to programs and coaches, administrators, and players, rather than ask tough questions about accountability. Uh, most recently, the Larry Nassar abuse case is one of the most well-known cases of abuse that went unaddressed and left hundreds of victims in its wake, but it's just one of many. So what we're looking at is what mechanisms can be put in place to hold colleges, universities, coaches, and athletic staff accountable for this. Um, I think it's important discussion because we don't always uh, break down how many different ways that abuse manifests in college sports. It can be abuse of athletes. It can be abuse by athletes. It can be abuse of coaches. It can be abuse by coaches. Um, the, the abuse can range the spectrum of all different kinds and uh, in all different trauma levels. Um, so there are layers of what should be protections that are not being used or held accountable for many reasons. And I'm very pleased to have these panelists on here to draw connections between some of the larger, the larger topics. Um, as an introduction, Janet Simon is an associate professor in the Division of Athletic Training at the School of Applied Health and Sciences and Wellness and College of Health and Sciences and Professions. Um, she earned a bachelor's at the, her degree from Southern Connecticut University. Did I get that? Southern Connecticut University, State University. Sorry, <laughs> that's my bad. Um, in athletic training, um, a master's degree in athletic training from Ohio University in 2010, and a second master's degree in applied statistics and, PH, and a PhD in epidemiology and biostatistics from Indiana University in 2014. Her research interests include measuring the outcomes of various rehabilitation interventions, as well as evaluating the health-related quality of life of high school and college athletes that suffer sports-related injury. Um, she also works on the use and development of patient-based outcome instruments for the purposes of outcome assessment and measuring the end result of healthcare services. She's produced over 70 peer review articles in various sports medicine and uh, orthopedic journals and has been a principal investigator or co-investigator on Department of Defense and NIH grants totaling over $8 million. And as an athletic trainer, I'm very happy to have someone who understands the physical science, the physical medicine part of it, but also Janet's work in the long-term quality of life for college athletes and for athletes in general is really, uh, is really helpful. We're gonna then move to Katie Lieber, who's the doctoral candidate. She's a doctoral candidate at the University of Texas, where she researches NCAA rhetoric and policy and was named the 2021 Moody College of Communication Outstanding Doctoral Student. Katie is in the process of writing her dissertation, which covers paternalism in college sports and how infantilizing language uh, harms college athletes. She's presented past research um, on ideology and policy in college sports at national conferences and is a freelance sports writer whose work has been featured in fan cited Forbes, Global Sports Matters. She's, she's, she's done the gamut. People, people wanna know what she has to say. Um, so in her, in her work, she discusses NCAA policy, sports law, uh, their effect on college athletes. She has written a novel called Surviving the Second Tier, which I wholeheartedly recommend everybody get. I can say that um, in February of 2022. And it discusses her research, including college athlete abuse um, and various kinds of mental and physical safety. She graduated from Western Kentucky University in 2016 with a BA in communication studies and in 2018 with an MA in organizational communications. Uh, importantly here, while at Western Kentucky, she was 
uh, a division one athlete running track and cross country, a two time Sunbelt conference champion in track and field, uh, both indoor and outdoor. And she also serves on the Drake Board of Directors. Um, so Kelsey Sachs is a doctoral student at the University of Tennessee. Her research focuses on cultivating and uh, healthy and high performance cultures within college athletic teams. Recent research endeavors focused on the importance of cultivating the safety, psychological safety within athletic teams and its impact on athlete wellness and, per excuse me, and performance. Um, but as when we say we have great panelists that bring their experience here, uh, Kelsey served as an assistant swimming coach at three different NCAA Division I institutions. Um, she was a student athlete on the swimming and diving team at the University of Idaho, where she graduated with her bachelor's degree and then went on to earn her master's in Tennessee, uh, her master's in recreation and sports management from the University of Tennessee. And finally, but certainly not least, uh, Emmett Gill is a PhD, the chief visionary officer for athletes and advocates for social justice and sports. Um, he is a valued member of the Drake Group family. Um, he is the founder of Athlete Talk, a wellness app for athletes. He served as the director of student athlete wellness and personal development at the University of Texas, Austin, where he provided clinical services for college athletes and created signature programming, including initiatives for injured athletes, substance abuse, and was a clinical professor in the Steve Hicks School of Social Work. So what we see is that we have a gamut of people who can speak to various experiences and tie them together. So what I'd like to do is start with Janet. Um, maybe you can just give us some, uh, some understanding, some background of how your work has shaped uh, the knowledge and abuse in college athletics. And I cover everyone by saying that they're expressing their own opinions, not the opinions of their institution, unless they say otherwise specifically. So Janet. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so like Tammy said, I'm Janet Simon. I'm associate professor at Ohio University. Uh, so one area that I study is outcomes of injury uh, and outcomes of athletic participation. So generally my work focuses on epidemiology of injury. So that's like how often injuries occur and what body parts they occur to um, and what kind of happens with those injuries. And then I also study the relationship between athletic participation, injury, and quality of life. So the first study I conducted was uh, in this area was in 2014. Uh, this study was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, uh, where we surveyed individuals who were former Division I athletes uh, later in life. Uh, so we surveyed individuals uh, about 20 years post their athletic career. Uh, at the same time, we enrolled individuals who um, attended a Division I university, but played uh, intramural sports or club sports. We wanted a comparison to people who were just physically active, not like high level division one athletes, but maybe were athletes in high school and wanted to continue to be active in college. So we enrolled kind of two of those groups and we did a bunch of different studies with these individuals. So the first study we did was just to survey them and ask them about their quality of life. So we looked at things like um, physical function, depression, sleep, fatigue, pain, anxiety, um, and we compared the two groups. And what we found in that study is that individuals who are former Division I athletes, so again, later in life, 20 years after their athletic career, they actually had decreased um, physical activity uh, that was reported by them. They had increased symptoms of depression. Uh, they had uh, increased pain, uh, increased sleep disturbances. Uh, as well compared to our like club sports or intramural groups. Uh, what was interesting with these, pe with these people who were club sports or intramurals, um, they, they kind of talked about when they left college, it was much easier for them to transition um, because they kind of chose to make like club sports or intramurals or pickup or whatever it was kind of part of their kind of life earlier on, whereas being a division one athlete is uh, there's a lot more scheduling that, you know, they're told when to work out and things like that. Um, so we not only did like self reporting of these individuals, we actually brought them in and did physical function testing with them as well. And uh, the division one athletes, um, again, it was a little bit sport dependent, which I can talk about uh, if there's interest, but uh, they um, were heavier, their BMI was larger, they had larger percent body fat, um, and then they did perform worse on some of these physical activity measures. 
Um, and some of this has to do with the sport they were playing. Some of it has to do with an injury that they sustained. Um, so we did see that individuals who were former Division One athletes, they had more severe injuries than someone who played intramurals or club sports. Uh, so they had severe injuries that maybe led to a surgery or something like that uh, compared to our other group. Uh, so that's kind of the work that I do, um, yeah, generally. remember to unmute myself. Um, we will definitely be coming back um, to some follow-up questions on that, but that I think that gives a really good uh, physical uh, understanding of, of how data shows the physical stresses and demands of college sports. Katie, I know as a former athlete, you can speak to this for probably a webinar in and of yourself, so I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Yeah, thank you so much, Sammy, for the question, the introduction, and also for taking time out of your afternoon to moderate this panel. We all appreciate it. Um, and Janet, hearing about your study, I was like, oh, man, that all sounds super reasonable and just very realistic, unfortunately. Um, you know, just talking about things like chronic pain, mental health issues. Um, these were things that really surfaced. They started in college for sure, um, but they definitely resurfaced for me as a retired college athlete. Um, I, and I say retired, it, it's kind of funny because I was like 24, you know, when I retired from college sports. Um, so I was young and I was still having, you know, very problematic issues with my mental health. I was having um, PTSD symptoms, um, like flashbacks, insomnia. Um, I was having these dis uh, dissociative episodes where I was having out-of-body experiences that were um, based off of these, these traumas that I had as a college athlete who was overworked, um, who was you know, coerced into overtraining and, and chronic injury. Um, and that was another problem that I had faced as a retired college athlete was I had hip issues, um, I had knee issues, and I was a distance runner, you know, so it's not like it was a, a contact sport or anything like that. It was just constant, constant wear and tear over um, a five year period. Um, and, and, you know, that's something that still affects me to this day. I still, you know, go to chiropractors. I still see a physical therapist for those issues. Um, not, not as much as when I was in college, thankfully, but it's still something that causes me day-to-day -day pain and still something that I have to manage with exercise. Um, I'm not at that 20 year mark yet as far as longitudinal studies go. Um, and I just I, I respect your, your study design too, because I know how hard it is to do those studies and it's just so incredibly important. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely believe the validity of those results. There you go. Okay, that and again, it's everything connects together and you can see how you can see how everything things that manifest even if you don't know what you're going through in college sports later on it, it definitely rears up. Um, Kelsey, with your research and how you focus on the performance side of it, I'd be very interested to go straight into you and and get your sense of this as well. Yeah, thank you, Tammy. Um, thank you all for being here and thank you for allowing me to join you. Um, as Tammy said, my name is Kelsey Sachs. I am a former collegiate athlete, so I swam in college um, and then actually got into college coaching and so was in college coaching for about five seasons uh, and then have since transitioned into academia. And I think what really inspired me to want to move out of coaching was to look for more ways that I can figure out how can we balance both performance and wellness. I know that performance is a key factor to athletics and it's going to remain a key factor, um, particularly in collegiate and elite sports. But at what point can we stop sacrificing wellness in order to perform? Rather, how can we use wellness as a variable and a mechanism to reach performance um, instead of looking at it as a dichotomous relationship? You get to pick one or the other. You have to sacrifice one or the other. Um, I think it's really important that we look at wellness as an avenue to performance um, and not only to performance as an athlete, but also performance later in life. Um, I think that if you can build those skills and as an athlete and build that idea around being able to have both, that's going to better serve you uh, moving beyond your athletic career. So having both experiences as an athlete and as a coach, um, I really believe that there's a trickle down effect, right? Student athlete experiences are really important to me. I want them to have healthy um, 
and enriching experiences. Uh, but I also know the importance of the coach in making that happen and facilitating it. I think the coach is just a pivotal person in their experience. And so we can't discount um, the education, the training, and the support that we need to offer coaches so that they can then trickle that down to their athletes. Because ultimately, they're the ones setting that experience and facilitating the culture with the, with, within which the athletes live. Um, I just did a study with about 12 female student athletes currently in Division One athletics. Um, and some of the things that they were saying was really interesting in that, you know, having support on the outside of the team was awesome. They loved it. Having social workers, having um, mental performance coaches, having academic advisors, fantastic. Um, but they also felt like, you know, they can only do so much. They can only pick up the pieces. So I really think we need to focus on the heart of the issue and how can we inform coaches and help them facilitate healthy cultures so that support staff aren't just picking up the pieces, but they're actually enhancing the experience rather than just helping them survive it. You, you know you're having a good panel when as one panel is talking, the rest of the panelists are nodding along with it as well. Um, and that I think this just tees right into your work, which would take me an hour and a half to list all of the different ways that you've been working on this for so many years and in all sorts of different abuse categories. Um, you know, and, and particularly with the emotional abuse and things around even the racial implications and the way that it manifests in abuse. So I am just going to tee it to you because everyone needs to know what you you have to say. I uh, no, I appreciate that, Tammy. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I'm, tr I'm trying these ear earbuds and I just learned how to open a PDF. So I'm a little bit behind on, on all the technology, but um, thank you for the introduction. And before I begin, I, I just want to um, I just want to acknowledge one of our our, our former colleagues who, who passed, Gerald Gurney. Um, Dr. Gurney was incredible. Um, he's part of the reason why, you know, I do the work that I do. Um, he's been a friend and a mentor, and you know, we we sorely miss him. Uh, he's an incredible advocate was an incredible advocate for college athletes. And, um, you know, his work lives on um, through things that happen, you know, whether it's at OU, whether it's through, you know, the tree that he's built with folks like Nikki Moore, who's the AD at Colgate. And of course, through the work of the Drake group. And then I say that because, you know, Jerry and I have started working on this topic together. Nonetheless, um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, Janet, Kelsey, Katie, you know, looking forward to having the conversation. My work in this area really began in 2006. And it actually began at the high school, junior high and amateur sports level. When I began to look at, you know, uh, in particular, um, sexual abuse, inappropriate relationships between coaches and athletes. And I started that work at the university, the State University of New Jersey, uh, Rutgers State University of New Jersey. And in my second year at Rutgers, um, the Don Imus situation happened. And for those of you who are familiar with the misogynistic comments that Don Imus made and the way that it impacted the Rutgers women's basketball team, you know, I considered that a, a wide scale um, instance of emotional abuse and verbal abuse and slander. And then after that, Tammy, um, about four years later, I started um, an effort called the Student Athletes Human Rights Project. And that project was initiated because of some football players um, at Colorado State University who had experienced um, some prejudice and discrimination that could also be characterized as verbal abuse. And during my time with the Student Athletes Human Rights Project, we had over 40 different cases where athletes' rights were allegedly violated. And in 10 of those cases, about 25% were athletes who were experiencing some form of emotional or verbal, physical abuse. And I know that we've come a long way because we have organizations like Safe Sport now, um, but we still have so far to go in particular in, in, in clarifying the line between, you know, old school hard coaching, you know, and what can be considered to be abuse. And we need to continue to do this and to build mechanisms because, 
you know, even if we look at the Kirk LaFrance situation um, out at Iowa, or, you know, we look at Mike Rice and what happened at, at Rutgers and the fact that we need some accountability within the, uh, within the NCAA. You know, after the Sandusky, after the NCAA got involved in the Jerry Sandusky scandal, you know, it was sort of a hands-off approach to different forms of abuse. Um, but there need to be some mechanisms, not only at the NCAA level, but the conference level, and certainly at the school level, because as Kelsey mentioned, you know, you have some individuals in athletics who can pick up the pieces. Um, but if you're if you're if you are an athlete and you're experiencing emotional or verbal abuse from a coach, what are your what are your what's your recourse? You know, especially if you're a scholarship athlete, you want to play. What's your recourse? You can go talk to somebody, but then what happens when the coach comes back and can identify you as the individual who spoke out by him or her? And the last thing that I'll say is. I think gender is an interesting uh, uh, variable, if you will, because we have a lot of men who are coaching women's sports and we have a lot of men who are still old school coaches. And then, you know, we also have a lot of women who are coaching both males and females who are trying to come up in the business, if you will. And so sometimes their coaching mechanisms can be challenging for student athletes. So a lot to discuss. So happy that we've had this opportunity. And, and again, a shout out to my, my colleague and friend, Jerry Gurney, rest in peace, my friend. Yeah, I have to, I mean, Dr. Gurney was in, an athletic director at OU when I was there. And we had a specific set of problems that went on while we were there. And he was a, a vigilant, will never even begin to describe the support and the humanity that he approached all of these issues with. And, you know, even not just as the athletes, but when I was a student athletic trainer, you know, we were, we were having a, we, we, we had some issues around some certain uh, staffing there and he was always someone that we could talk to. So the, the, the world has lost a great friend um, and the sport and the work has lost a tireless advocate. And so if, if anyone is not familiar with Dr. Gurney's work, first off, find us on the Drake group. <laughs> we'll, we can do that. But, uh, you know, look, take a look at some of, his, some of his work and his research and the way he advocated for athletes in their academic abuse. I mean, he, he was a tireless advocate of athletes being abused academically, forced into, into courses they didn't want to have to take or assumed that they couldn't take regular courses. Uh, you know, shoving them in the rocks for jock kind of situation or recruiting athletes who then they got no support once they were at the school. Maybe they needed a little bit of remediation and some help. And he was, I, I don't think there can be enough said about the work that Dr. Gurney uh, does and how that will, how that will carry on. We're already getting questions in the, uh, in the chat. And fortunately, some of them are already ones um, that, that I had asked. Janet, some quick follow-up that a couple of people have had for you. Um, they're wondering if the quality of life outcome, um, if you could speak a little bit more on the sports, uh, the difference in the sports that it would be, um, whether or not your work is limited only to division one. Um, and Britt Collins has asked if there's significant difference in men's and women's sports and how she can read your study. <laughs> Yeah, sure. So the, I think there's a few questions there. So the first study we did was just in Division One athletes uh, compared to those students who attended a university at, that was Division One playing club or, or intramural sports. Um, and that was just because that's what we had access to. Um, and but we have done a couple follow up studies uh, from that, a few different ones, and and I can put them in the Q and A. I think the um, references to those. Uh, and even a follow-up study. So we've done a few follow-up studies. One we've looked at, because um, one of the questions we got when we first published the study was like, it's all like one sport, it's all football, right? It's gotta be football, they're the answer, like they're the problem, right? Um, so we did, we, we looked at, um, and we weren't able to look at individual sports because we would need a really big sample size to do that. And uh, this data is already really hard to get. Uh, so we broke up sports into um, collision uh, sports. So those are things like um, football, 
hockey, uh, men's hockey, um, ice hockey, uh, and then contact sports. Uh, so that's like where contact is made, but it's not like the sole purpose, right? To like tackle somebody. So that's things like basketball, soccer, uh, and then non-contact sports. So that would be things like track um, and, and things like that. Um, so we did do that study as a follow-up. Um, and what we did find is, is it is true. Like there is some merit in that, right? Our, our collision sports, uh, they suffered um, more severe injuries um, that were documented by them. Uh, and, and they did have more pain that they complained of. And uh, they attributed that to maybe surgeries that they had and, and things like that. So we do see that there is some sort of a potential sport component here, uh, just because we see certain injuries more common in certain sports. Um, and that's some of the epidemiological work that I do, right? We know that some of these more um, traumatic injuries tend to happen in more sports that have contact um, or collision uh, in them, right? So like, we don't see femur fractures, for example, in uh, swimming for, you know, just that that doesn't really happen that often, or if, if at all, but we do occasionally see them in other sports, uh, just as an example. Um, so there is a sport component to, to it for sure. Um, regarding division, uh, we have replicated this study in um, all divisions, uh, division one, two, and three, then we have found very similar findings. So it doesn't seem to be appearing that division is really that different, right? Division one, two, three, uh, it really seems to be more of a sport component um, potentially uh, is there. And then obviously the type of injury uh, for at least the physical kind of component of this. Uh, we still saw deficits in like depression and things like that across all sports, um, but kind of this pain uh, and physical limitation aspect of it, we do see in those sports where we tend to see more of those serious, um, we'll say like, you know, requiring surgery type, type injuries. And, and I can put those um, references here uh, in the Q&A. Okay, that'd be fantastic. And we'll, uh, we'll send that out um, also with the, with the follow-up uh, email that goes to, goes to all the attendees. Um, I think that this, this kind of tees into, and I, I believe everybody will probably have some thoughts on this, but the discussion, the difference between an athletic model and a medical model in college sports with respect to who answers to who, um, to whom. Um, and, you know, we see it in the athletic training side, does the athletic training staff answer to the strength coach kind of thing, but also is the model so uh, siloed and insular that the coach, whether it be, you know, we, th we think about it in terms of big time football and that kind of thing, but it can, it can be the case with anyone. If the, you know, if the buck stops with the coach, um, you know, when we're talking about accountability, and athletes feeling like they can have a recourse to try and address these situations. Do you feel a difference that the, you know, that the, the current athletic model, as it were, uh, basically leaves the foxes in charge of the hen house? And if you think that was a softball question, you'd be correct. <laughs> um, but you know, I wonder what you all have to say about the, the current structure of, of accountability that, that we see in college sports like that. I think Katie, let's, what do you, what do you have to say on that one? I realize that everybody's muted. And so. About the current model of accountability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and that's something I honestly really struggle with when I talk about policy research, because I view so many of these negative ramifications that athletes have in terms of, you know, mental health issues, injuries, and things like that. And it's like, what, what can they do? if they are being abused by a coach. Um, and it's, it's just, it's such an unanswerable question for me, you know, because I'm just like, I, I mean, you could, you could potentially report it, um, but then there's no guarantee that anything is going to get done, especially if the coach is, is high profile, if they're, you know, a very well-paid football coach in the middle of the contract, it's like, is the university going to do anything? Um, you know, I, I also, could advise athletes to maybe, you know, transfer. Um, but 
you shouldn't have to uproot your life because of something that somebody is doing to you like that should not that that responsibility should not be on the victim. Um, and so I think one of the huge policy failures that I see in my research is there is a lack of accountability. There's a lack of, of communication and objectivity in reporting. Um, third party reporting for athletes would go a, an incredibly long way in making sure that they aren't being pushed too far by coaches, that they aren't being coerced into overtraining, um, you know, that coaches aren't threatening to pull their scholarships if they don't perform, because that is a shockingly common practice. Um, and I honestly do think that there needs to be more um, boots on the ground in terms of monitoring coaches. Um, I would love to see, you know, people come in and monitor practices and make sure that coaches are not doing these um, unsavory things to athletes. Because something that I've noticed um, as a retired college athlete is that some of, the, actually, a lot of the behaviors that take place in athletic contexts are not normal, but they're normalized. You know, there's nothing normal about physical punishment for not reaching an athletic goal. There's nothing normal about um, running 80 miles a week. You know, it's like, there's right, nothing, right. yeah, there, there's, there's nothing normal about flying across the country over the weekend, flying back, getting in at 1 a.m. and having to go to an 8 a.m. class on Monday. There's nothing normal about that, but so many of these behaviors are normalized and it all contributes to ill health. Um, for college athletes, that includes physical health and mental health. And then when coaches, you know, are pushing athletes too hard or and they're not being held accountable for it, it just encourages that behavior to continue. So one of the huge policy failures that I see is there's a, a lack of avenues for athletes to go to communicate when they're being harmed. And there's there are no enforceable rules that prohibit coaches from abusing athletes and trainers as well. I think that's a great. I think it's a great point, and it actually goes back to something that Kelsey, you had you had made mention of in your in your opening comments about informing coaches. And I wanted to know a little bit more about how you, not in only in your experience, but also in your your empirical work, the the how do you balance or how do you advocate and work within the space of informing coaches, but also holding them accountable? Because what what training really do some coaches have to be doing? their jobs? Like how, how do you navigate that within your research? Yeah. So I think a lot of research shows that while there are coach education programs, most of them are going to be focused on like tactile or technical skills. So there's very limited um, coach education happening on intrapersonal or interpersonal skills that are so necessary in order for them to effectively teach um, a sport properly. Uh, and it also brings me back to the reason why policies and practices and processes are so important within an organization, um, because if we're just leaving it to the person to decide whether they value uh, an athlete as a person before as an athlete, then their experience is just dependent on that person. But if we have policies to back that up and procedures to back it up, despite whether that person um, is willing to value an athlete as a person, um, they'll have to follow those policies and those procedures. So I think that's where policies and procedures and standardizations become really important um, because it backs up what you can hold people accountable to after you've informed them. I think that's, I think that's a fantastic point, Emmett. Yeah, Tammy, I, I just wanted to add, I think with the proliferation of, of mental health providers in athletics, that's provided us with with one avenue for athletes to report, you know, for example, as a as a licensed clinical clinical social worker, you know, I am bound by my license, you know, to report if someone uh, reports abuse to me. I think the second thing is is that we have athletes who are coming in to school at younger ages, and so if an athlete was physically, emotionally, sexually abused, and they're under the age of eighteen, then they have campus police, they have local police, and they have other mechanisms that they can bring in. Now, I'm not familiar, and I'd, I'd love to hear from, from uh, those of you who have experience in trainers, because is there any uh, creed or, 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 or something of that sort that's related to your work that, that suggests that you also have to report? But at the end of the day, I think 
the challenge is, and Katie alluded it to, is that we've all got mortgages to pay when we work in athletics. And whether you're a social worker, whether you're a trainer, whether you're a sports supervisor, um, that could be, your job could be at risk, especially if you do have, you know, a high profile coach. And then the last two things that I'll say is one, in addition to mental health workers now, we also have, uh, there's a company out there named Real Response, who's doing a lot of great work and providing a mechanism for student athletes to communicate um, challenges that they're having with regard to abuse. And then the last piece is that some athletic departments have a reporting line to the provost. And when you're reporting line to the provost, that sort of changes the game because now you have a direct line to larger campus resources. You know, as great as college athletics is, and I'm so excited that it's Thursday and the games are coming on tonight. and They're going to be back on this weekend and I'm going to see how my bracket is going. College athletics is a part of the higher university system, the higher education system and, and the state system for public institutions. And I think it's going to be more so incumbent on universities to figure out what they can do to protect athletes from abuse than it is than athletic departments taking this on. Because at the end of the day, it's a risk management issue. And I think with the generation that we have coming up, because we are so because they are so in tune to mental health, that it would behoove universities not to get ahead of this, um, because I just think we're going to see more and more cases. And, you know, athletes pursuing these cases in a way that, you know, they, they really do have, you know, opportunities to seek recourse in the courts. Yeah, Emmett, I'd, I'd like to go off of what you were saying about mental health, because I think that's such an important conversation. Um, and it's so it's so encouraging to me that it's becoming more common for athletes to talk about mental health, because it's so important as an athlete to take care of your mental health, whether you know you are in an abusive situation or not. And I would argue it's even more important if you are in a negative situation. Um, and that's something that I didn't do as a college athlete. And we, you know, we had the resources on campus. I just wasn't aware. Um, so college athletes, you know, if you are in a situation where your mental health is declining for any reason, whether it's because you're injured or because you're not performing well, or you're not getting along with your coach or your teammates or, or any other stressors that you're having, I would encourage you to seek out campus resources. And as far as any, um, like if there are any athletic directors or coaches or athletics workers who are listening, please make mental health resources accessible for your athletes. Um, because that was another issue with my university is we had, you know, broader campus resources, but we didn't have anything that was athletes specific. We didn't have anything that was located within our athletic facilities. So um, Western Kentucky University, we're the hilltoppers because our campus is literally on top of a hill. Um, and and the, the counseling center was at the very top of the hill. And that sounds so minor, but when you're a college athlete and you're juggling, you know, school and competition and practice and off-season training and everything else, climbing to the top of the hill for a counseling session can be very difficult to do. So I really encourage any athletics workers to really be intentional in making those resources available for college athletes and accessible. I definitely think that's right. And I want, I, I want Janet to be able to, to follow on from the athletic training side of it, but to piggyback on Katie, I think that that on top of that, they need to under, people need to understand the schedule that athletes keep. They're not going to be able to come during a typical business hours, um, you know, I mean, they technically could because their mental health holds a priority, but it is difficult to navigate around their other time constraints and everything. So I think you're right that having uh, mental health professionals internal to the athletic department who understand the dynamics of that is really important. Um, Janet, I'm kick it to you. There are so many questions in the chat, by the way, on athletic training. I want you to, I want you to, to follow on what Emmett was saying as well. Yeah, I think what Emmett's saying is a good point. And there's actually been a couple of research studies out there looking at having athletic training services and what everything under that umbrella uh, in the medical model. So whether that's part of the health system or it's in a college um, or just out of athletics. So basically like they're doing the hiring decisions and, and funding. Uh, so there's been a couple of research studies and they've actually show like um, services that are housed in the medical model, um, they 
um, treat less patients, which then leads to better outcomes. So they actually have less injuries, less recurrent injuries, less concussions, uh, things like that. So there actually is some research out there showing like the medical model will lead to better care uh, for athletes um, in the long run, in current and, and in the long run. And uh, so there's a couple studies out there on that. And I think it just shows more evidence that removing those barriers, right? Emma, you're saying like, um, you know, paying a mortgage, right? Being beholden to a coach or whatever it is, it kind of removes those or tries to remove those barriers uh, because your paycheck isn't tied to the athletics department. It's now tied to, you know, an academic side of it of, uh, you know, either it's the health campus on, on campus or at our university, they're housed actually in the same college that I am. So they're housed in the College of Health Science and Professions. So they're the ones who, you know, our dean actually is the one who like signs their paycheck, not that they're signing paychecks, but you know, that's, that's where, that's who's funding it. It's out of athletics and that's new. We, we just transitioned to that. And that's because of the policy uh, that the NCAA kind of put out as like best practices or whatever. Um, so I think that there is gonna be more and more push for that because the research is showing that it's better healthcare for athletes. We have better outcomes. Um, Regarding like reporting, like you were asking about like reporting abuse and things like that. Um, so athletic trainers are certified and, and most states have licensure um, or some form of licensure and, and it is a part of our code of ethics. So if we know of abuse, we are legally required to report it. Uh, so, so we are mandated reporters in, in that sense, um, at least the states that have licensure and, and most states do uh, at this point. If I could add one more thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe that, or I know coaches are mandatory reporters as well within a university, but it kind of comes back to what Emmett had said at the beginning, right? Is there's still that distinction between what's tough coaching and what is abuse? Sorry, my dog. Um, so if we don't know what that is, uh, I think there needs to be further delineation of what that gray area is and how can we make that a bit more black and white as far as behaviors that are acceptable and behaviors that aren't. Um, because yes, coaches are mandatory reporters, but I may also not see anything wrong with what's happening because it's been so normalized within um, college athletics or just athletics in general. No, I think that's a great point. And it helpfully puts into, because we could definitely talk, I mean, there's, again, this, this topic could be an entire, an entire day worth of panels, but everyone has sort of made mention to it uh, slightly, but let's talk about coaches and staff that can transfer out of a situation or get a new job. And there's no accountability that follows them with that. And I think what Kelsey's point, I mean, we saw the tragedy at University of Maryland. That was, and I mean, I'll say it, I think that was criminal. It was absolutely criminal because um, there's just no, there's no reason for that sort of, for that sort of training to happen. And then coaches can go and get other jobs, even with this following them. So for anyone who wants to jump in on it, the, um, how, how do we bring the idea of accountability to coaches who are just going and getting new jobs in other places? I mean, social media helps because Art Bryles has had a very difficult time, uh, as well he should, um, you know, navigating within the coaching realm, uh, following his complete failure as a human and a coach, again, my words, at Baylor. Um, but how, you know, what do we, what do we do? How do we bring accountability to that in a system that coaches are just used to being able to move around and sort of just jump to the new place? Who wants to step in that one first? I'll just say this. I think that, I think that it's really important to start thinking about conference level, you know, the way that conferences are governing um, the, the member institutions within their conference. Um, I don't, just don't think that this is something that the NCAA is going to address. I think the college presidents are too far from it to address it. And even if we look at the situation of, of Pat Chambers, you know, the former um, uh, Penn State bas men's basketball coach who, you know, said to a, a young black male, I'm trying to make sure, what is he said? Something about a noose around his neck. 
And he was just hired by, you know, a program down in Florida. How, how does that happen? I mean, you know, when we deal with abuse in amateur and high school sports, we call it passing the trash, right? And we seem to pass the trash very publicly, right, in, in, in college sports. I mean, Mike Rice, who was videotaped throwing basketball at, at young men, you know, uh, he had a couple of opportunities um, to go back into coaching. Phil Martelli is now coaching at Michigan, and he was a, a part of that whole piece. So, I mean, I think that we really have to, you know, conferences have to stand up. But the other piece is parents have to stand up. You know, sometimes we forget that college athletes are actually someone's son and someone's daughter. And, you know, we've seen instances where there have been groups started um, in both men's basketball and in football you know, parent groups, but they've been largely solid. And this is an issue where they can have a tremendous impact. But just to close, you know, I, I want to go back to, to what Kelsey was saying. And that's that from a policy standpoint, we need to start mandating coaches having more training beyond X's and O's. Because back in the day, the coach used to be the PE teacher and the PE teacher knew a little bit about adolescent development and Erickson stages and identity versus identity confusion. And you can't say to a kid, you know what, if you don't start playing better, you're going to end up in your community working at McDonald's. You know, you just knew that you didn't do that. So I really think that we need to, to bring in the parents, look at conference level initiatives. And as Kelsey said, you know, do more training for coaches in this area. And if I could add one more thing um, to piggyback off of that, that I think coach education is so important because coaches are likely a product of the system themselves. So they've been coached in a particular way that's been normalized and they're just replicating that. And maybe from my experience, I think a lot of coaches have good intentions. They're in it um, with the intentions to try to develop people um, as athletes and hopefully as people as well but I don't think they have the tools in the toolbox or um, the support to recognize that things are more, some things are more important than a win and loss record. I don't think they're getting that message from other people. Um, so yeah, I think we need coach education to break that system because they're also products of the system that is broken that we're talking about. Definitely. Um, so uh, there's a, a question in the chat that actually, um, I'm not surprised that it's coming from Patrick Ruby uh, and was gonna lead to, um, you know, to sort of a, a, a larger topic about when we talk about the parents being able to advocate um, and stand up for uh, the, you know, the young college athletes. Um, and side note, I realized one of the times that I had a, at one of the universities I worked for, we actually had a 16 year old, a 15 year old golfer. She hadn't gone to, to high school. And she came into school and I just, I, I can't imagine the mental stress that college must have been on her. Um, I hadn't really thought about that till Emmett, Emmett said it. But, um, you know, the idea of Patrick makes reference to uh, the off-season safety problems. And when we talk about football, um, sudden death in college players and heat-related illnesses are most frequently seen off-season and in conditioning uh, drills that are you know run by strength coaches and things like that. The NFL, uh, uh, the 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 players' association was able to bargain for safety uh, privileges and safety rights uh, to protect NFL players. We don't see that in colleges, and so how do any of you see the ability of athletes who clearly have a voice more than they have in the past? Um, you know, certainly one that's being listened to more than they have in the past. How, do, how does that work in the accountability sense and the athletes being able to say, we are gonna stand up for these safety mechanisms or these mental health protections or, you know, these kind of accountability. How does that feed into the accountability system? Um, I'm thinking Katie, that she probably has some thoughts on this. Yeah, that's honestly, that is a difficult question, um, you know, because, you know, so a question or a, a comment that I always get when I talk about the rights of college athletes to stand up for themselves, um, you know, and advocate for very basic human rights and safety initiatives and things like that. A comment that I get is like, oh, well, if they don't like it, they can just leave. 
And I think that that is such a shallow and privileged take because it does not take into account the fact that these are 18, 19, 20 year olds, 17 year olds, and I guess 15 year olds too, I didn't know that, um, you know, who are tied to their scholarship as their main source of income. What a lot of people do not understand about athletic scholarship policies is that they are usually not full rides and they are usually not four-year deals. They're usually partial renewable scholarships. And it's very, very easy for a coach to, to revoke them, um, even though there are NCAA guidelines and policies that are designed to prevent this from happening. It's still very easy to do. Um, you know, my personal example is, at the end of my freshman year, um, which was not a good year for me at all, a coach pulled me aside at the end of our conference track meet and said, okay, Katie, that was your warning year. If you don't step it up, you're losing your scholarship. You know, And so when athletes make a ruckus, when athletes advocate, when athletes don't do what good athletes do um, and just shut up and take it, coaches can push back against that and they can push back using that athlete's only source of income to do that. So it, it's, it's a very difficult question for me to answer because my immediate, you know, my immediate thought is, yeah, like go to social media, go to the AD, you know, sit out your practices and your games until you get what you want, but it's actually a lot more complicated than that. So that's a very unsatisfactory answer to your question, Tammy. I think all of the, um, I, th I think there, there isn't one, there isn't a good answer to it, but Emmett is going to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, no. What I, I was going to say, Tammy, is I, I think we saw a little bit of that advocacy uh, that athletes need to do for themselves when the players at UCLA, the football team earlier during COVID, you know, they were very vocal about safety around COVID and, and what they were supposed to do and what they weren't doing. So I think it's happening. You know, but I think, you know, again, the work of, you know, Ramogi Huma, you know, who runs the National Collegiate Players Association and, and the things that he's done, I think he just filed some litigation this week are going to be important because I, I think we're two or three years away from a college athletes union. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. If it's not two or three years, maybe five, no more than five. And I think this issue of, you know, coaching abuse is, is going to be one of their big ticket items. And that's the, the, the real... I think that's going to be the, the the game changer in this area, unless you know a, a parent group steps up or an, an advocacy an advocacy group that specializes in this area, which I'm sort of perplexed as why it hadn't happened. I mean, if you really if you really think about some of the issues that are percolating in college sports, you know, you, of course you've got name, image, and likeness. You've got the transfer portal. I think a lot of stories probably come out of the transfer portal with regard to can come out of the transfer portal with regard to abuse. But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be something similar to um, a professional players association that happens on the college level that's going to help us a lot in this area. I'd love, to see, right. sorry, I'd, I'd love to see politicians get involved with this issue with the same energy they've gotten involved with in NIL. Yep. I think, I think that's, I, I high five, I commend, I do the wave. That, that that is where, and I, I've got sort of a follow question uh, towards the end, but one of the things that I wanna go back to, and it, it was, I have it in my, in my list of questions here, and it's already come up by at least two people in the chat. And it's the idea that how is diversity in medical teams, coaches, support staff, things like that, how is the diversity or lack thereof in these silos, how does that make it inadequate to address the issues of, of these athletes? Um, and, you know, I, do, I would start, Kelsey, I'd love to start with you, just how, how in your understanding of, you know, you're, I, we have great researchers here, so your empirical understanding of how this shakes out on top of your personal understanding of it. Sure. Yeah, I think one of the main precursors to an environment that can be ripe for abuse is power differential. And we know that there's huge power differential between coaches and athletes, but we also know that certain identity issues like a, um, um, having a male in place coaching a woman, right, can only add to that power differential. So it further creates a division between the two rather than bringing them together. So I think it can just exasperate the issue. Um, and also 
not allow um, for outlets for athletes to feel comfortable to approach someone when there is an issue, right? It just, again, it continues to create a bigger chasm um, rather than a partnership. It's coaches on this side, athletes on this side. Yeah, I think so. Um, Janet, I, you know, I wonder with your, with your in-depth understanding of the medicine side of it, uh, you know, race-based medicine is a thing. And so there's understandings around doctors that were trained that, you know, certain non-white demographics apparently don't feel pain kind of thing. And, and it's, we see it play out even in 2022. How, how do you feel like uh, diversity and inclusion and representation in the medical side helps to treat and support athletes from the physical medicine perspective. I think it's extremely important. Um, we know from you know the medical literature, um, individuals from ethnic and diverse backgrounds have better patient care, better patient outcomes when their provider looks like them or at least appears to look like them. Uh, that that's in the literature. It's very solid and. Uh, is we see it in athletic training also, and that's what I can speak from, but, um, you know, athletic training is extremely white. Um, we just are, uh, and it's something that our national organization um, tries to address um, because our, our patient demographic is, is kind of the opposite. Um, and there is literature showing that, that we can give better patient care to, to our athletes if, if, if we, if if there are more people who look like them that, that are treating them. Um, and there's some research out there uh, looking at other minorities as, as well, like LGBT minorities and, um, you know, having a safe space and all of those things. So I think it's extremely important. And I think the literature is, is coming out and it's been out in other fields like, you know, general practice medicine and things like that. But we've got a long way to go to kind of, you know, have our practitioners more be more representative of, of our patients certainly definitely katie did you have some look like you wanted to chime in on that or am i just making that up no i was it actually made me think of um gender specific and sports specific medical issues and how having um trainers who understand that is super important so um eating disorders are very very common in um endurance sports and i I never had a female trainer in college who understood the mentality that goes behind it because um, we would we would usually be told, you know, when we were underweight, oh, just eat more. Like it's not hard. All you have to do is up your calories. It's like, well, no, it's actually very, very hard. It's it's much more complicated than just eating a cheeseburger. Um, you know, and so I, I really do believe that having um athletic trainers who can understand your sport and your gender and um even you know race specific issues are incredibly important. I think so. And and Emmett, I mean, your work in the social work community, that that has to be completely on point with respect to you feel more comfortable discussing mental health or any emotional issues or anything that comes up with someone who you feel like might understand what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's like, and it, it sort of goes to, to, to Katie's point. I mean, around disordered eating. I mean, you know, for a, a male possibly trainer to work with a female student athlete and understand disorder eating or understand the the emotional impact of body shame you know that's a challenge right um and then on the on the race side um as you were speaking tammy what really came to mind is trauma you know because trauma and trauma-informed care is something that we're really just starting to validate however you know when we think about adverse childhood experiences and the literature around that and we look at the demography of the big time sports, women's basketball, men's basketball and football. You know, we're primarily talking about black and brown kids. Right. And there are a lot of coaches out there that will say things like, well, you're better off here than you are at home. Right. And so when they say that, that's sort of like, uh, are they thinking they have carte blanche to say what they want, and do what they want to this kid? Because this situation, they're assuming this situation is better than their situation at home. And so when there's that trainer who might not be black and brown or that social worker who might not be black and brown or that psychologist who's not black and brown, 
they might not understand, you know, that the things that this coach is saying to this kid is emotionally abusive and re-traumatizing them. You know, whether they have experienced, you know, whether it's just, and I don't want to say just, so let me take that back, whether they've experienced divorce or they've had a friend die in front of them, or, you know, they've experienced some type of systemic racism. It would be hard for a practitioner who doesn't have the same narrative to understand that. And that happens a lot. You know, I know in my experience, and I worked at four different Division I athletic departments or with four different um, Division I athletic departments and just kids who come to me and say, do you know what my coach said to me today? Let me tell you what they said to me. And I'm like, these are things that you would not say to your own child. Why would you say it to someone else's, right? But again, it goes back to, to what, you know, folks have said here, and that's that, you know, if you don't know, you don't know, right? And it's like that model of abuse. You know, abusers tend to abuse others. So coaches tend to coach like they've seen others in their, cir others in their circle coach. And so, you know, it really goes back to that, you know, trying to help them understand. And I'm really excited because I have one um, Division I athletic department, the submit major that's having, um, we're doing a training for the coaches um, on uh, mental health and, and black and brown athletes. And we're really gonna talk about some of these issues um, because, you know, coaches, if you don't know better, you can't do better. Yeah, that's, thank you for that. That is just so incredible. It, it just shows the interconnectivity between all of these different kinds of things and how representation matters in all of the silos and across all of the sports and across all of the divisions and all of the conferences. Um, so I'm going to kick it to kind of a, a larger question with accountability, and that is to, and, and this is to everyone, how, how do we reconcile the NCAA's hypervigilance about an athlete getting a pair of shoes or a free meal in the, you know, in contrast to their complete abdication of responsibility with respect to health and safety, especially since that's why the NCAA was created. And now 100 plus years later, they're still, my words, I have no problem with it. Uh, they're completely unfit for purpose. So how do we, we've talked about, you know, having it at the conference level and that can be good. Then you start peeling the onions back of school shifting conferences and things like that. So how, how do we reconcile the NCAA's hypervigilance on certain kinds of uh, infringement and not in health and safety? And if it's not the conferences and it's not the NCAA, like how, what, what do we ask for here? If that, if that makes sense. Kelsey's like, yeah all of it. <laughs> um, you know, what? how, Kelsey, I would, I would like to start with you. Um, if you would, unless Emmett, did you have a, a thought right there? You know, I was simply going to say until, you know, we're going in the wrong direction, you know, because with, with the, all the avenues that you have to gamble now, you know, the NCAA's primary interest, in my opinion, is, is to protect the integrity of the game because there's so much. I mean, I was watching the Michigan, I was watching the Michigan State Duke game and there was a guy once the game got tied up, he was betting right there. And I'm like, you're going to lose because Duke's going to win. But he was sitting there betting. Now, I wonder how upset he would have been when he saw Tom Izzo last year during the conference jack a player up on national mm -hmm. TV. Right. And so I don't know if the NCAA is going to ever come around. My short answer is because gambling is so important and that's their interest as opposed to protecting athletes which they have proven time and time again is not in their interest yeah i i mean i agree did anyone did anyone have some some thoughts on that because if not i will uh further direct it to a sort of a follow-up question if it's not the ncaa are there is there accountability at a legislative level that should happen. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of notorious for my uh, theory that there should be a ministry of sport because it would, you know, the, then Olympic sports and governing bodies and uh, college sports, youth sports, everything, there would be some level of cross silo accountability. But, uh, you know, is there, is there anything legislatively that 
you all feel like could be done or should be done? <laughs> like, no. I'm going to backtrack and maybe take it from the approach of the first question. I don't know if this will answer it, but I do think that it is like indefensible as far as how much care we put into things that are really outside of the scope of what we should be caring about at like the heart of what we do, which is athlete health and wellness. So I don't think we can really defend or explain why there's been so much care into other areas. And I, I don't know if it will change, but I, I keep coming back to, we have to come up with like, what are non-negotiables and what are we willing to negotiate about and what behavior are we just not willing to tolerate? And if we come up, if we have behavior that we're not willing to tolerate, then we have to hold people accountable to that. And I think that accountability um, will then inform people and make them realize that I cannot act this way. Um, because I will be held accountable. And there are so many aspects within sport, like what Emmett was referring to whenever Tom Izzo got into his player, or you see instances like that all the time, and it's really just championed within sport. As far as a part of sport, it adds to the entertainment. But at what point do we remember that these are people? And um, we have to continue to remind stakeholders in sport that athletes are people first. And that has to be the priority. So I really think addressing how people think about sport, especially people that are working with athletes, maybe fans, maybe it's not as important for them, but people that have direct access to athletes. Um, yeah, I think we need to change how they think about it. Yeah, and Tammy, going back to your broader question about the NCAA's priorities in their policy. This is one of the reasons that policy is so fascinating to me because, you know, policy is supposed to be objective. It's supposed to be, you know, these are the rules that everybody has to abide by them. Um, but the thing is like, there is so much power embedded into policy. Um, and I think one of the reasons that the NCAA is so insistent on maintaining amateurism and one of the reasons that they've been so reluctant to embrace NIL is because if you can keep athletes poor and hungry and scared and dependent, you can control them. And I think that that level of control that coaches can exert over their athletes, it makes the, it makes sports competitive, you know, because we are, we are pushing, and I say we as in like the college sports industry is pushing college athletes to their limit with very little compensation in return for their efforts. It's keeping them in this cycle of power. It's making them dependent. And it's also making them into these, you know, phenom athletes, you know, because they are being pushed too far. That's not okay. It's not sustainable. But I think it's one of the things that that keeps college sports at an elite level. I don't think that paying athletes is going to have a negative ramification on that, but I think it's the NCAA's way of maintaining control and keeping things very competitive and keeping athletes hyper vigilant and afraid. Um, you know, and, and Emmett talked about uh, about Tom Izzo. I, I think about coaches grabbing their athletes on the sidelines all the time for two reasons. You know, because I think that. It, you know, if I were to grab a student like that in one of my classrooms, I would be fired um, and I would be rightly fired immediately. Um, and I also think, you know, if a coach is willing to do that publicly, it really makes me wonder what they're doing privately as well. And that and that's one of the reasons we do need accountability here. That's a great point, because we only see the top of that iceberg. Um, you know, you think back to Bobby Knight, what, what, what would have come out if digital media was around during his heyday? Um, I use heyday a little bit loosely, but let's let's sort of um, because we are getting towards the end, and there is I apologize to the audience. There is zero chance that we will get to every single question, so look for the follow up email um, to get some of these things answered. But one of the things that I think um, you, we Jessica Luther was going to be a panelist uh, before she was taken with taken with COVID, which I can say because she said it on Twitter, and you know one of the things that she would have talked about. Um, is her work extensively on sexual abuse and the lack of accountability in that silo. And, uh, you know, she's her, I think it's her first book, The uh, Unsportsmanlike Conduct, The College Football and the Politics of Rape gets into some very detailed uh, timelines of people transferring uh, back and forth, uh, you know, offenders and either offenders, offender coaches switching jobs or coaches ignoring 
transfer athletes that may have had a history of things. So what I'd, what I'd like to know from all of you all is, you know, in the context of that, how does the media play a role in letting coaches or athletes in some cases off the hook, sort of almost in an apologetic way that you kind of know is going to be access journalism? How, how does anyone, if you have any thoughts on that, how does the media and the lack of accountability in media or by media and of media uh, feed into feed into some of these problems? Everybody's like, I'm not touching that one. Uh, you know, I think I think just to sort of give an idea of if if you're talking about a coach like Urban Meyer, who you know can move around to a lot of different places, and people are like, oh, shucks, he just whatever, but you know, as, as Emmett was using examples of him talking about, uh, you know, just really snide references to athletes' transcripts. And you knew exactly what he meant when he said that. He was, there, there was a very specific direction to that. But he, he doesn't seem to, you know, there are still people that cover him as if he's no big deal. Um, Art Bryles had apologists, still does have apologists. Um, it can the media weigh in on that and be a help as opposed to a cover-up. Um, I, I think they, I think they can, Tammy. I mean, um, you know, one of Kelsey's colleague is, colleagues is uh, cohort members is one of my former students, um, Lauren Beasley. And, and we did work on, on the Baylor sexual assault scandal and, you know, Jessica's work and the work of others was very important. Um, I think the media has a, has a large role in it and they can be very positive. But again, you know, a lot of media are also former athletes and, you know, it's that old school, you know, that's the way it happened back in our day and we're okay, maybe or maybe not. And so it's okay, you know, and I think the other piece is, you know, unfortunately, you know, some of the accounts based on the circumstances, victims aren't taken seriously. You know, um, they try to go through the coach, then they try to go through the athletic department. And, you know, sometimes they try and go through the university and they're not taken seriously. And so, you know, I think sometimes the media questions the credibility, you know, of, of victims and of the circumstances around it. Because when we think about things like you know, Murray Sperber's beer and circus and what college sports and what campus life is all about, those sort of visions come to our head when, you know, these are very real circumstances and they're things that have happened and, 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 and young ladies have said no and they, they've tried to do the best that they can to bring attention to it. And, you know, for journalists, sometimes if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't read and, and they, just, they just look past this. But at the same time, Tammy, you know, again, the work that Jessica did, the work that was done around the Standusky piece, you know, the things, the, the uprise that Art Browse experiences when he tries to get a job or when he has a job at Grambling State University, those things are making a difference. But I think that part of it, and I'll, I'll shut up, is that I think what we see in the media, the social, the, the social media in particular, those aren't our traditional journalists you know, who have gone to the to the Northwesterns or gone to Syracuse. They're the folks who, you know, know a lot about sports, can talk a little bit, and they, they're trying to get a whole lot of likes and a whole lot of followers. They're not the same folks who, you know, when we think about things like the Pelican Brief, you know, had that, those ethics around them that were very important. That's not the majority of people that we see co covering college sports right now. The majority of the people who are trying to break the big story so they can get on the big network or they can get the big podcast. And that's what they're more interested in. So um, I'll be quiet, but it, it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. Katie, were you going to, did you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say something like a media trope that drives me nuts is when Lane Kiffin, for example, when he throws a film projector during a practice, he's labeled as eccentric, um, you know, instead of instead of um, problematic, like and it, it's almost like a charisma thing. It's like, oh, he's so passionate, like he cares about his athletes so much that he loses 
control of his emotions. And it's like, that's not a good thing. Like normal adults don't, don't do that in any other context that would be incredibly unprofessional and dangerous. Um, and so I think just the media not feeding into those very gendered stereotypes as well, you know, whereas like a woman would be labeled as like, oh, she's unhinged or she's crazy. Um, but just like not leaning into the so-called charisma of, you know, abusive coaches, because I see it too. Like if a, if a coach grabs an athlete on the side, on, on the sidelines, it's like, Oh, he's a passionate coach. He, he just, he needs to get that athlete's yeah. attention because he cares so much. It's like, no, that's really, really problematic. And he shouldn't do that. Um, and so I think the more the media calls things like that out, the, the better off we'll be moving forward. Um, and I think another, another just best practice for people in journalism and in the media, you know, who are looking to publish stories about college athletes and want, you know, real transparency. Um, and this might sound a little bit obvious, but whenever I talk to college athletes, current college athletes about sensitive topics, I always tell them, if you want me to make this anonymous, I will. Um, because that, you know, it protects their identity, it protects their safety, and they're likely to be more open about their experiences. I have one more thing as well. I think where the media has a great impact as well is whenever we don't have coach education um, and we see, like Katie was saying, coaches that cannot regulate their emotions are labeled as eccentric, right? We have these youth coaches who are just volunteering their time. Likely there's no certifications, you know, college coaches, professional coaches, they don't really have education either, but certainly not youth coaches. So when they're looking at elite levels of sport and seeing that that's celebrated and that's accepted and that's okay, um, maybe that's the only information that they're bringing in and applying to the youth sport athletes. Um, and I think that that can be especially problematic uh, when we're not even looking at elite athletes, but that's informing how coaches approach um, our youth athletes. I think that's an excellent point. And I'm, I'm scrolling through some of the, uh, some of the chat that is, is definitely backing up the, um, the comments like that. Um, Emmett, there was a question in here. Have you found software programs like Real Response to be helpful in forcing accountability for sports organizations? What are the other innovations out there that organizations should be looking into to hold ourselves accountable and give athletes a greater voice? Well, since I have a, a, a mental health athlete talk, uh, <laughs> I'm like, how much am I going to say about Real Response? But I think it's, I think the, the initial feedback is it's been good. You know, I think the athletes are really trying to find and athletic departments are try, really trying to find the best way to use real response. Um, but a number of athletic, you know, organizations, not just in college, but, you know, across sports are signing on to use real response. Um, so, you know, the initial feedback has is, is been pretty good. I think one of the things that we found with athletes, um, wh whether it's mental health services or whether it's, you know, reporting some form of abuse is they don't know the how. You know, how do I do this and how can I do this in a way that protects me? So things like real response are definitely going to be um, be an asset um, to athletes in that sense. If I could shamelessly yeah. self-promote two a days, um, we also have a co-trading tool on our website where prospective athletes can uh, just check in on coach uh, on coaches at programs where they're interested in committing to before they, you know, e even invest any time and energy into those programs. Um, it's they're completely anonymous reviews from former athletes. Um, they're all verified, so they're all accurate, um, you know, representations of these athletes' experiences. Um, so there are different um, different very variables and different prongs that athletes can can talk about with their experiences with those coaches. So that's one of the ways that we're holding uh, coaches and institutions accountable and trying to educate and empower athletes there too. I think that's, yes, and self-promotion, shameless self-promotion is always welcome on any webinar I ever have. That's just the way it goes. You work hard enough for it, promote it. Um, and just yeah, one, one quick thing. Oh, oops. Go ahead, Emmett. No. No, I just want to say one quick ad, and that's with NIL, you know, you're going to have some college athletes who could potentially be making just as much money as assistant coaches, you know, and what's that dynamic going to be like when they're talking to an athlete sideways or they put hands on an athlete? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we're hearing about these enormous NIL deals, so I, I think that's going to be something that happens organically that may also impact on um, the issue of coaching abuse. I think I think that's right. 
Um, Janet, there's a sort of a theme of some questions in the in the chat that I would um, love to hear. If how would you recommend knowing that uh, medical professionals and athletic trainers are you know confined to privilege and patient confidentiality and things like that? If you had something that you would want to say to athletic trainers, uh, whether it be student or full time staff, based on your understanding and your work, what would you say to them with respect to how they can help, how they can look at the idea of accountability in that and how they can do it within their position, wherever it may be? Yes. <clears throat> so I think what it comes back to is, you know, when you're in that position, you are in a little bit of a weird power dynamic depending on how you're hired right so we've talked about like athletic versus medical model and the benefits of that but i think what it comes down to is your licensed healthcare professional and your goal is to be there for the health and safety of your patient right we always say like athlete and things like that but these if we if we do the corollary here to you know our, our medical doctors right our physician practice there'd be no place for some of this, right? That, that they would never be tolerated, which, you know, Katie was talking about earlier, you know, this, this behavior would never be tolerated in those settings, right? Like in an academic setting, like putting hands on a, a, a student, right? Or something like that, I, we, we'd all be fired. Um, so I, I think the problem is, is, you know, athletics has always kind of been able to skirt this issue, right? Somehow, right? And I think it comes down to is if we want to be licensed medical professionals, if we want to call ourselves that, we have to act like it. Wow. That would be my advice. <laughs> that says it right there. That says it right there. So we are coming up on the end of our time. What I'd like to do is give each of you a chance to just sort of, if you wanted to have a, a sort of just a closing comment, whether it be something that you wish people would take away from it or just a way that, you know, just a, a just a brief commentary on how to coalesce your thoughts on the matter and I'm going to go in order of how you are on my screen so Kelsey if you if you want to just give some give some closing thoughts sure yeah well I appreciate all of your insight I feel like I've had an opportunity to learn from all of you today as well so thank you for sharing all of your insight um I think yeah Whenever something is no one's responsibility and no one's assigned to it, right? Nobody's gonna take ownership over it. So we have to designate um, whose responsibility is this and how can we monitor it and how can we hold people accountable to it and also um, decide what behaviors are just, have no place in sport and have no place um, anymore and then decide to hold people accountable to that. And so I think that once we can delineate that, make those decisions, um, accountability has to come on the back end as well. I think that's right. Janet, did you have any any closing thoughts? I, th I think one thing that I like to just say is, you know, we see athletes for a very short time, right? They're they're in our care for, you know, maybe it's a year, maybe it's five years, but it is a short time and they're going to leave our care and we want to send them out and be successful. And there's so many cases of that we see where transition is just so hard. Uh, for, for retired athletes, as, as Katie was talking about earlier. Um, so I think the thing is, is we need to think about their long term health and their long term, you know, success in life and not just for a one to five year career that most don't move on from it at a professional level. So I think that's what we need to come back to as well as we need to set them up for success long term. Excellent. Katie, what is your What's your, your closing setup here? Yeah, I would say, you know, it, it can be very easy. And I think that this is a root problem in abusive situations. I think it is very easy for people to dehumanize athletes and not just college athletes, but professional athletes. You know, we view them as salary totals or we view them as stats or, you know, we view them as um, like fantasy league points. And, and so it's so easy to strip athletes of their humanity. Um, and so I think that, you know, complicating and humanizing and recognizing that college athletes are whole people. Somebody alluded to that earlier. Um, I just think that that's so incredibly important. And I think that extends to athletes as well, because it's very easy to self objectify and self dehumanize and only think, oh, I'm, I'm only as good as my next game or my next race or 
however my stats end up at the end of the year, you know, and, and that's not true. And it might sound, you know, corny and cliche, but you are more than an athlete. Your college career is going to be four, maybe five or six years long if it's a longer career. Um, and I agree with Janet that not only, um, you know, athletics workers, trainers and, and practitioners need to focus on the holistic and long term well being of college athletes, but I want to extend that to the college athletes themselves to um, have that holistic long term approach when thinking about your health and your well being. Excellent. Emmett, final thoughts? Um, first of all, Tim, I'd like to thank you um, for doing such an outstanding job, you know, moderating um, this panel and, and to Janet and to Kelsey and to, to Katie um, for their expertise. Um, it's a really important topic. Um, I think what I would say to, to athletic directors is that you really need to have this on your radar because, you know, Union for College Athletes is coming and you should, you know, risk management should also have should also be meeting with athletic directors to do this. Uh, to the parents, I'd say it's, it's time to stand up. I mean, I get a lot of emails. I get a number of emails from parents who, you know, are trying to figure out what to do about um, their son or their daughter being in an abusive situation. And, you know, parents have to just stand up. Um, but what I'd like to say most is to piggyback what off of Janet and um, Katie said. Um, there's several cases out there, and I can't remember the specifics, but I, I think one of the sports was softball. And the whole team did this intervention where they went and talked to the coach, and they really talked about, you know, how their abusive experiences with that coach and nothing was done. And so several years later, they came back to talk about it, and they talked about depression. They talked about anxiety. They talked about substance abuse. And they also talked about how they had been involved in coaching or as parents and were now do using some of the same abusive, verbal abusive um, techniques that their coaches use. And so to go back to Janet and Katie, these are real folks. And abuse is not something that happens. It's something that happens and their consequences. They're like real life consequences. And the one that I left off of that list is suicide, which is sometimes the third, second, or fourth leading cause of death amongst athletes. And that's real. That, that's just so real that what, what Janet said that in some situations, we're leaving these kids in worse situations when they leave than when they came to us. And I think that's the biggest travesty. That's not what we're paying coaches to do. Coaches are supposed to be mentors. They're supposed to help develop young people. They're supposed to inspire them. They're not supposed to leave them suicidal with depression, substance abuse issues, and anxiety. And maybe that's what we need to talk more about are some of the outcomes that happen when coaches are abusive. Maybe that's the way we need to go. But it's an important topic. Just thankful to you, thankful for the Drake group. And, and again, um, shout out to my man, Gerald Gurney, um, who is also an advocate for this type of work. Absolutely. And thank, I thank all of you again. What you just heard was barely the tip of the iceberg on what is a very long discussion that has been happening for decades and will continue to happen for decades. But I hope that what you heard from these four panelists is, are things that you can take with you to change your perspective and how you look at college sports. And if you're in a position where you can push for accountability in college sports, I hope that all of you that are watching this uh, have been able to take away, take away something to make your practice and your profession and your treatment and your engagement with uh, college athletes and the business of college sports even better. So thanks very much to Two A Days. Um, thank you all for taking your time. Um, and we will facilitate some answers to questions um, over the follow-up email, I believe. Katie's nodding, so I think I'm not screwing that up too badly. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Take care.